live from Copenhagen, Denmark, it's theCUBE, covering Nutanix.next 2019. Brought to you by Nutanix. Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage of .next Nutanix. We are here in Copenhagen. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight, along with my co-host, Stu Miniman. We're joined by Karen Openshaw. She is the head of engineering at Zen Internet Hi. and Justin Fielder, the CTO at Zen Internet. Thank you both Hi. so much for coming. You're first timers on theCUBE, yeah. so welcome. We're going to. Thank you. We're really excited to Thank have you. you. Why don't you start by telling our viewers a little bit about Zen Internet, who you are, what you're all about. Yeah, sure. So um, Zen is um, a UK-based, we're up in near Manchester, um, managed service provider. Um, we turned over this year about 76 million pounds, um, which is um, a great achievement for us. That's about, um, that's double digit growth we've had for the last few years. So we're really starting to motor as a business. Um, we employ about 550 people. Um, we have about 150,000 customers split across retail, um, indirect. So we have a very big channel business. We have a wholesale business where we sell our infrastructure um, that then other people productize and put into um, solutions for their customers. And then we have a corporate business, which is where Nutanix really comes in. Um, so we offer managed services both in networking, um, hosting, the value added services that are required to make all that safe and secure and um, a solution for a corporate. Great. So, uh, you know, managed service provider, uh, your company's been around for quite a while. It predates when all, everyone was talking about cloud. Maybe give us uh, kind of the update today as to where you really see yourself fitting, what differentiates you, uh, your, uh, your, your company in the marketplace. So I suppose, um, I mean, Karen can add sort of what her team does, but I suppose the, the big difference is Zen is a very people-first company. So Richard Tang, our founder, he founded the company um, nearly 25 years ago. Um, he stated publicly he's never going to sell it. That it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a very, very people-orientated company, which of course has great um, affinity to Nutanix's own um, people-first values. And Fundamentally, we believe that we always want to do the right thing for the customer, even if that is difficult. Um, and yeah. so I don't know whether you want to say about, you know, how you pick up some of the, the, the hardness about keeping up with customers. Yeah, so we have customers that come to us asking for things that we don't necessarily sell at the time. And uh, we, we put quite a lot of effort into adapting our products at the time to deliver them what they need. Um, some of those challenging conversations can be about making sure the customer is getting the right product for what they want. So understanding what they need, making sure that we can support them, not only in taking that product, but coming onto the product in the first place. Uh, and that's what we use a lot of our Nutanix infrastructure for. Yeah, great, Karen, maybe, maybe can you dig us in a little bit? You know, what does Nutanix enable for your business that ultimately then has an impact uh, on your ultimate end user? It's done two things for us. So the first is our IT operations. So we've been on a, a journey, I guess, over the last three, four years, consolidating all our legacy and um, physical team onto virtual uh, services. We've used Nutanix to do that. So we've, we've collated all of our services. We've got about 90 odd percent of all our legacy services on, on that IT infrastructure now. So operationally, it saves us a lot of time, effort, uh, cost, et cetera, much more reliable as well. Conversely to that, we also use it for our, our products offerings as well. So we used to be um, managed hosting where a customer would come, give us a spec, and we'd, we'd go and build a physical server, host that in our data center, um, host their applications on there, support them with that. We don't really do that anymore. We now use Nutanix as our hosting environment. So we've reduced our environmental footprint, we've reduced the amount of space that we need in a data center and the power that we put through there. Again, operating that is, is it's easier for us because we can consolidate where the skills are from in terms of both IT ops and in terms of the infrastructure for the managed services as well. One of the things that you said, Justin, is that you're a very people first company and that really fits in well with the culture at Nutanix. Can you, can you riff on that a little bit and just describe what it is to be working so closely with a company like Nutanix and, and how important it is that your cultures mesh? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, Nutanix has been part of um, Zen for, for many, many years. Um, and, you know, we work in the industry, I've worked in this industry for 25 years, and nothing stands still. 
literally nothing stands still. And therefore, whatever you thought was a good idea last year probably is now <laughs> the worst possible idea because there's some great new idea. And I think it's that pace of change. And so what we've really found with Nutanix is as, as they've got to know us and we've got to know them and they can see that we're starting to really be able to take some solutions to the market that really resonate, that what they've done is they've literally embedded their people in our company. So we have um, our systems engineers, our account managers, they come up to our offices, they sit down, they understand our people, they understand where we're trying to go, they understand our propositions. And this is a journey for Nutanix. I mean, Nutanix in the MSP land is, is not where, really where they started. They started, like Karen just said, like we use them. That's actually where we started was, oh my God, I've got a thousand servers, and this is just too much. Yeah, it's too much hassle to try and segment it yourself. Um, and it, it, it's, that, it's that sort of hypervisor of hypervisors of hypervisors type approach. It just makes it easier. But conversely, it's therefore really important that you work out how you take that value proposition to a customer. Because if you can't explain it because it's so easy, how do they know wh whether this is going to solve their problems? So that's been a fantastic part of Nutanix. It's, it's really the Nutanix team feel like the Zen team, yeah. and they're saying that they also feel the same. So, you know, things like nothing ever goes 100% right, but it's always, you know, who's cool, they're always, because you've got that personal relationship, and that's really important to us. Yeah. It, it's more than that. So, what we've found with the Nutanix guys is that they'll help us fix problems that aren't necessarily mm. Nutanix problems as well. So, that's something we don't get from any other uh, of our suppliers. It's normally, no, that's nothing to do with me. You need to phone someone else to get support on that. Nutanix guys will, they'll bring in their own experts on that particular combo and, and they'll support us through that. So yeah, that, it's that good experience. Spe speaks very much to the partnership that you're saying. Absolutely. They're not just a supplier yeah. of a product yeah. to you. Um, no, when, when, when I talk to the customer base, one of the biggest challenges you know, any company has these days is uh, really understanding their application portfolio. What needs to change? What needs to stay the same? You know, Microsoft pushing everybody to Office 365, you know, changed a lot of uh, companies out there. You know, what do I sassify? What do I put in managed service provider? What do I just you know, build natively in the public cloud? Can you bring us through kind of you know, what you're seeing at your customer base and yeah. you know, where, where that does interact with uh, the journey that Nutanix is bringing people on? Yeah, I mean, maybe I can take that one. The, all of our customers are on a journey. Um, and they need help. They, they seriously need help for the, exactly that reason that you've said. Um, I mean, this is, this, is my, this is my job to understand this stuff. That's, that's what a CTO of an MSP is required to do. Um, the problem is, is, I don't know, if you're a CIO of, we, we're really good in construction. You can revolutionize the construction industry by the application of IT, particularly during the sales cycle, you know, the ability to VR walk through, you know, argument, or augmented reality, all of that sort of really cool stuff. And then you've got a thousand subcontractors that you're trying to manage from an IT perspective. And that juxtaposition of the problem is really problematic, I think, for a lot of people. And so what we've done is we said, the first step you can do is just take what you've got and get rid of the management overhead. That's the easiest, simplest, straightforward. And some of the Nutanix, the sort of lift and shift capability that they've got, that they will go and inspect a workload somewhere else, they will work out what resources are required for it, they will pick it up, and they will move it. And we've had some fantastic success with our customers. They, they're, they're our gracious advocates who say, oh my God, it just happened. One day it was over there, the next day it was over there. Um, and then you can start to analyze what that, what's happening. And that's where we can really add value because this is not as simple as just an application because it's about your security posture, it's about your DR requirements, it's about what, what your appetite for risk versus reward versus cost. And that's really hard to do when you don't have the simple thing which is there, which is, oh, that, serve, that piece of tin cost me $10,000 and therefore you can work that out yourself. So I think the, the key to all of this is giving tools to the end users, so the, the, the CIO in that company and their IT team, so that they can make those choices in collaboration with an MSP like us. Um, and that goes back to what you were saying, it's about you know, when we hit problems, we might not even know there's a problem before we've hit mm -hmm. it, and therefore having Nutanix deeply embedded within us is really important to then being able to go back to the customer. And sometimes to the customer, you actually have to go, what are you doing? <laughs>
<laughs> that isn't yeah. going to work <laughs> in the long term. And, and, and as you said, you also have to sh pr provide the value so that the customer understands what they're actually getting too. Yeah. In terms of uh, customers' future needs, are, are, are we are living in this multi-cloud world. How are what, how would you describe the customer mindset and how are you coming in with solutions that work for the customer and then having to break the, break the news to them on occasion that what on earth are you trying to do here? This is not going to work. <laughs> yeah, we, have, we, have, we have a few um, interesting, it's sort of like, okay, are you going or am I going to tell them? <laughs> I, you know, and, 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 as, as you can tell, I always send Karen. <laughs> yeah, so off you go. He doesn't really. <laughs> um, I, I think it, it's, uh, and, and this is where I think we work really well, you know, it is about what is going on. Karen, work with your engineering teams, try and understand deeply actually what is going on. Why is it not a good idea to do that? And that's the, that's the thing. Once you're going to explain why, I say, oh God, thank God for that. So finally, mm -hmm. someone's telling me why what I'm trying to achieve isn't the best way to do it. Because I think a lot of, a lot of people just sort of, you know, it's a bit buzzwordy and they just think that they need to do this. And, you know, it, it's, I mean, uh, talk about, you know, the journey we've been through, just sort of how do we move yeah. stuff onto there? What's that, three years? I've guessed yeah, it's three, four years now. I mean, yeah. you know, it's a huge amount of work. I mean, yeah, Karen, any, any, any lessons learned uh, maybe that you might oh God, be able to could, share yeah, there? Yeah, you could do probably uh, about 50 of those. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any that I could uh, repeat here? Um, <laughs> best practices. <laughs> it, it, it is, I think one of the biggest challenges is the, the reskilling of your teams. Yeah. Mm. So um, getting everybody, first of all, to understand this, this bright new future that you're moving into and then getting them trained up on it. And, and training is not just going and sitting in a classroom, it's going and working on this thing and seeing problems occur and understanding how to fix them. That's the, that's the biggest problem that we, that we probably went through. I guess we want our customers to not have that though. So we, we want them to give us their, their workloads and their IT and we'll sort that for them. And that, that's where we want to we want to take it. I think in the future, helping them understand what they can do with cloud. So we, we don't just do private cloud, we do public cloud as well. So we can introduce um, opportunities and concepts from a public cloud perspective as well. Um, that will, that will, AWS is a, is a really good one, and we are looking at other providers as well. So we help customers solve their problems, whatever that problem is. One of the things that's so uh, salient about Zen Internet is that it has a really strong culture. You said it's a people-first people, people first culture, but it's also a very diverse culture. Uh, bringing in multiple perspectives, uh, women in technology, LGBTQ, uh, other races. Can you talk a little bit about what it means to work at a diverse company and how it changes how you think about problems and go about solving them? Yeah, I guess, it's a really good question. I, I guess working in a company, we're not as diverse as we like to be. We, we're not where we're at in terms of um, balancing out uh, the number of women in the tech roles in particular um, and, and the diversity. But if we give everybody a voice, which is the main thing, then uh, we will see a more, a more wide ranging set of inputs there. So um, developing our teams, high performing teams, you need that mixture of input there. Not just about women, by the way. It's about it's about we mm -hmm. have a Pride at Zen network, for example, where we try to ensure that diverse diversity and, and diverse people feel included in what we do as a business and well, as well, and have an opportunity to have an input into that. So, where does it add for us? I guess people just think differently when they're from different yeah. cultural backgrounds. They're from different um, different nationalities, different. Um, uh, races, I guess different sexuality, different gender, they've all got different life experiences. So solving problems is, is probably the main thing that you get the benefit from there. And this industry is full of people trying to solve problems um, and bring in diverse teams, not just about women in tech, because we, we saw three women speaking this morning at the keynote, which was fantastic to see. Um, but it is about the diversity as well. So uh, innovation, is the, is the key there, I guess. Mm. And I think, I think it's, it's not just about your staff. Um, if you've got the ability to think differently, 
that applies throughout the entire ecosystem. Um, and you, you know, you can you can take a differing view. So we work very closely with the TM forum because you know that that's sort of our mm -hmm. industry, and it's the sort of the, the the whole application stack about how you approach that. And the TM forum have, have really done some fantastic research that that now proves that the output is different if you have a diverse input. And that, I think, for our customers is really different, is, is really important, because Zen's different. Mm -hmm. We're not one of the big guys. We're not a BT. We're not a Deutsche Telekom. We're not, you know, we're not one of these people. We think differently, we act differently, we behave differently, we have a different approach. And the people first, I mean, you know, that doesn't mean we're, you know, we're, we're just here for a good fun time. We're here to drive this business forward, to, gen to generate profitability that we can reverse back in the business to enable us to get onto bigger and greater things. And we've got a five year plan, which will see us, you know, at least double revenues quite happily. And we're very confident now that we can execute that, assuming we can get that diversity in the business. And it's a huge challenge. It's how do you reach out to those people? How do you use the right language? How do you overcome unconscious bias. Yeah. You know, that's a massive yeah. thing. Yeah. Um, and, it, and it's great. Again, it, it, Nutanix just resonates with us. Just um, some of the little stickers around, they are diverse. They've got different yeah. representations yeah. of people and it shows that someone has thought about that and that will resonate. And it's always the classic thing that, you know, you do something wrong once, people will remember it forever. You do a hundred things right, People won't even notice it, and that's the that's the type of approach. So, um, for us, we, you know, we think it's a really exciting bit, and it's something that the entire executive at Zen are absolutely focused yeah. on: is getting this right because we know it will secure our future. It'll make all the difference. It'll yeah. make all the difference. Great, yeah. Justin and Karen, thank you so much for thank coming you. on Pleasure. the Cube. It's great. I'm Rebecca Knight for Stu Miniman. Stay tuned for more of the Cube's live coverage of .next from Copenhagen. <laughs>